Hi guys, welcome to part 11 of the book of Jubilees. Today we are going to be reading through chapter 38 to 43. Once again, if this is your first time joining us on this channel, welcome, welcome, welcome. But you might want to go back and start with part one because we are a good ways into this epic. Now down in the description box below, I will have a link to the playlist from the Dark Outpost. That is where you will find all the other previous episodes on this book and previous episodes on other missing or banned books from the Bible. Just a reminder that on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock, 1 to about 3 p.m., I will be on the Dark Outpost platform, which is a separate platform from YouTube, to be reading this book and making commentary on this book with David Zublick. Because that show is now a live show, you are welcome to call into the show and also partake in the commentary and the discussions around these books. What we do on my channel on Wednesdays is that we just recap everything we did on the Dark Outpost. So those of you that are not on that platform have the ability to also participate in the reading of these lost Gospels. I also want to note that the second hour of the Dark Outpost, we are going to be talking about some of the more fringe Christian organizations, especially in the Protestant world. Right now, we are talking about Michael and Debbie Pearl, and we are reading the book together to train up a child. Now, unfortunately, because of the subject matter of to train up a child, I will not be able to read that on YouTube. There is too much ABUSE in that book for me to be able to read it on this platform. My channel would probably get heavily censored because of all the topics. So if that is something that you're also interested in, usually we do that at around the two o'clock mark on Tuesdays on the live show of The Dark Outpost. Now with that being said, if you are also on The Dark Outpost platform, all the episodes are then cataloged on the homepage. So if you do miss the live show, you can go back and re-watch a replay. I want to, as always, give a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers. Honestly, you guys are rock stars, and I am so flattered and humbled by how many of you are helping us keep this channel going. My appreciation to you guys is endless. I love you all, and I thank you, thank you all from the bottom of my heart. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. So without further ado, let's get started with chapter 38. This is the war between Jacob and Esau at the Tower of Hebron, the death of Esau, and the overthrow of his forces. So again, where we left off last week, Esau and Jacob were at each other's throats and they were about to go to war. And after that, Judah spake to Jacob his father and said unto him, Bend thy bow, father, and send forth thy arrows, and cast down the adversary and slay the enemy. And mayest thou have power, for we shall not slay thy brother, for he is such as thou, and he is like thee. Let us give him this honor. And Jacob bent his bow and sent forth the arrow and struck Esau his brother on the right breast, and he slew him. And again he sent forth an arrow and struck Adaran the Armenian on the left breast and drove him backwards and slew him. And then went forth the sons of Jacob, they and their servants, dividing themselves into companies on the fourth side of the tower. And Judah went forth in front, and Naphtali and Gad with him, and fifty servants with him on the south side of the tower, and they slew all they found before them, and not one individual of them escaped. And Levi and Dan and Asher went forth on the east side of the tower, and fifty men with them. And they slew the fighting men of Moab and Ammon. And Reuben and Ishkar and Zebulon went forth on the north side of the tower, and fifty men with them, and they slew the fighting men of the Philistines. And Simeon and Benjamin and Enoch, Reuben's son, went forth on the west side of the tower, and fifty men with them, and they slew of Enoch and the Horites four hundred men, stout warriors, and six hundred fled, and four of the sons of Esau fled with them. And they left their father lying slain, as he had fallen on the hill which is in Adoram. 
Now it's interesting that Reuben's son is named Enoch. Enoch obviously is a big family name and we will be getting to the book of Enoch. We've gotten a lot of requests from the book of Enoch. After we finish the book of Jubilees, we are going to read the Apocalypse of Abraham and then we're going to read the book of Enoch. So hold tight, we will get to that specific book, but this Enoch, which is Reuben's son, is not the same Enoch that the book of Enoch was written by. I think most of us know that, but I just wanted to make that clarification. And the sons of Jacob pursued them to the mountains of Seir, and Jacob buried his brother on the hill, which is in Adoram, and he returned to his house. And the sons of Jacob pressed hard upon the sons of Esau in the mountains of Seir and bowed their necks so that they become servants of the sons of Jacob. So the sons of Esau and the sons of Jacob are again cousins. Esau and Jacob were twins. And they sent forth to their father to inquire whether they should make peace with them or slay them. And Jacob sent word to his sons that they should make peace. And they made peace with them and they placed the yoke of servitude upon them. So they paid tribute to Jacob and his sons always. And they continued to pay tribute to Jacob until the day he went down into Egypt. And the sons of Adam have not quit the yoke of servitude with which the twelve sons of Jacob have opposed on them unto this day. So again, Jacob is Israel. He was given the name Israel. So the twelve sons of Jacob are the twelve tribes of Israel for those who maybe forgot about that or not totally familiar with this story. This story is in the book of Genesis. It is in the Bible, but the book of Jubilees gives us a little bit more detail on these stories. And these are the kings that reigned in Adam before they reigned any king over the children of Israel until this day in the land of Adam. And Balak, the son of Belor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Deneba. Now again, I'm going to apologize, as I do almost every week whenever we get to these old, old, old names. I'm probably saying them wrong. I'm trying the best I can. It is what it is. These are not names that are used heavily today, so forgive me if I am saying them wrong. And Belek died, and Jacob the son of Zara and Bozar. And Belek died, and Jobab the son of Zara and Bozar resigned his steed, and Jobab died, and Hashem of the land of Taman resigned his steed, and Asam died, and Adath died, the son of Barad, who slew Midian in the field of Moab, resigned his steed, and this, in the name of his city was Avith. And Adath died, and Salam from Amizquah resigned in his steed, and Sal Salmon died, and Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his steed. And Saul died, and Belian, the son of Archer, reigned in his steed. And Bethelion, the son of Archer, died, and Adath, and reigned in his steed in the name of his wife, Metabeth, the daughter of Marat, the daughter of Mezabithiab. These are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom. So this brings us to chapter 39, where we're going to get into Joseph. Joseph's service with Potiphar, his purity, and his imprisonment. And Jacob dwelt in the land of his father's sojourings in the land of Canaan. So again, sojourings means journeying. So we know Abraham started that journeying, which is uh, Jacob's grandfather. These are the generations of Jacob. And Joseph was 17 years old when they took him into the land of Egypt. And Potiphar, a eunuch of Pharaoh, the chief cook, bought him. And he set Joseph over all his house. And the blessings of the Lord came upon the house of the Egyptian on the account of Joseph, and the Lord prospered him in all that he did. And the Egyptian committed everything into the hands of Joseph, for he saw the Lord was with him, and that the Lord prospered him in all that he did. And Joseph's appearance was commonly and very beautiful was his appearance. And his master's wife lifted up her eyes and saw Joseph, and she loved him and besought him to lie with her. But he did not surrender his soul. And he remembered the Lord and the words which Jacob, his father, used to read from amongst the words of Abraham, that no man should commit fornication with a woman who hath a husband, that for him the punishment of death hath been ordained in the heavens before the Most High God, and the sins will be recorded against him in the eternal book continually before the Lord. And Joseph remembered these words and refused to lie with her. And she besought him for a year, but he refused and would not listen. But she embraced him and held him fast in the house in order to force him to lie with her. 
and closed the doors of the house and held him fast. But he left his garment in her hands and broke through the door and fled without her presence. And the woman saw that he would not lie with her, and she calumniated him in the presence of his Lord, saying, Thy Hebrew servant, whom thou lovest, sought to force me so that he might lie with me. And it came to pass, when I lifted up my voice, that he fled, and he left his garment in my hands when I held him, and he brake through the door. And the Egyptians saw the garment of Joseph and the broken door and heard the words of his wife and cast Joseph into prison, into the place where prisoners were kept, whom the king imprisoned. So she basically did a little projection, didn't she? Scheming little woman. That's interesting. And he was there in prison, and the Lord gave Joseph favor in the sight of the chief of the prison guards and compassioned before him, for he saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he had to prosper. And he committed all things into his hands, and the chief of the prison guard knew of nothing that was with him, for Joseph did everything, and the Lord protected it. And he remained there two years. And in those days, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, was wroth against the two eunuchs, against the chief butler, and against the chief baker. And he put them in a ward in the house of the chief cook in the prison where Joseph was kept. And the chief of the prison guard appointed Joseph to serve them, and he served them before. And they both dreamed a dream, the chief butler and the chief baker, and they told it to Joseph. And as he interpreted to them, so it befell on them. And Pharaoh restored the chief butler to his office, and the chief baker he slew, so Joseph had interpreted to them. But the chief butler forgot Joseph in the prison, although he had informed him of what would befall him and would not remember to inform Pharaoh how Joseph had told him, for he forgot. And that actually ends chapter 39. Very interesting. So we're starting to get, this is very exciting, we're getting into Joseph. And if you remember, I think it was last week or the week before, we saw that Joseph was kidnapped and kind of sold into Egypt. And his brothers put some you know, blood from an animal on his garments to convince their family that he had been like eaten and had died. And they don't really know that he's still alive and in Egypt and he's living in this prison now. All right. So this takes us to, to chapter 40, which is Pharaoh's dreams and their interpretations, Joseph's elevation and marriage. And in those days, Pharaoh dreamed two dreams in one night concerning a famine, which was to be in all the land. And he awoke from his sleep and called in the interpreters of dreams that were in Egypt and magicians and told them his two dreams, and they were not able to declare them. And then the chief butler remembered Joseph and spake of him to the king, and he brought him forth from the prison, and he told his two dreams before him. And he said before Pharaoh that his two dreams were one. And he said unto him, Seven years will come, in which there will be plenty over all the land of Egypt. And after that seven years of famine, such a famine has, hath not been in all the land. And now let Pharaoh appoint overseers in all the land of Egypt, and let them store up food in every city throughout the days of the years of plenty. And there will be food for seven years of famine, and the land will not perish through the famine, for it will be very severe. And the Lord gave Joseph favor and mercy in the eyes of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, We shall not find such a wise and discreet man as this man, for the Spirit of the Lord is with him. And he appointed him the second in all the kingdom and gave him authority over all Egypt and caused him to ride in the second chariot of the Pharaoh. And he clothed him in garments and he put a gold chain upon his neck and a herald proclaimed before him El Eloi Abirir and he placed a ring on his hand and made him ruler over all his house and magnified him and said unto him only on the throne shall I be greater than thou so now Joseph's like second in command of all of Egypt this brings us to verse 8 and Joseph ruled over all the land of Egypt and all the princes of Pharaoh and all his servants and all who did the king's business loved him for he walked in uprightness, and he was without pride and arrogance, and he had no respect of persons and did not accept gifts, but he judged in uprightness all the people of the land. 
And the land of Egypt was at peace before Pharaoh because of Joseph, for the Lord was with him and gave him favor and mercy for all his generations, before all those who knew him and all those who heard concerning him. And Pharaoh's kingdom was well ordered, and there was no Satan and no evil person therein. And the king called Joseph's name Sephantiphanus and gave Joseph the wife of the daughter of Potiphar, the daughter of the priest of Helopus, the chief cook. And again, I hope I'm saying Joseph's Egyptian name right. And on the day that Joseph stayed before the Pharaoh, he was 30 years old when he stood before the Pharaoh. And in that year, Isaac died, his grandfather. So now we're going back in time a little bit as we previously read with Isaac and Rebekah's death where they made Jacob and Esau, his fa uh, Joseph's father and Joseph's uncle, make the pact not to hurt each other, which we just read about the war that happened where Esau died. So now we're catching up on what was happening with Joseph basically during that time. All right, so again, verse 12. And in that year, Isaac died, and it came to pass, as Joseph had said in the interpretation of his two dreams, according as he had said it, there were seven years of plenty over all the land of Egypt, and the land of Egypt produced abundantly, one measure producing 1,800 measures. And Joseph gathered food into every city until they were full of corn, until they could no longer count and measure it for its magnitudes. Okay, so this brings us to chapter 41. It looks like we might be going back now to um, the Middle East, back to uh, Joseph's brothers, because this chapter is titled Judah's Incest with Tamar, His Repentance and Forgiveness. And in the 45th Jubilee in the second week in the second year, Judah took his firstborn heir, a wife from the daughters and of Amron named Tamar. But he hated and did not lie with her because his mother was of the daughters of Canaan, and he wished to take him a wife with the kinfolk of his mother, but Judah his father would not permit him. And this heir, the firstborn of Judah, was wicked, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said to Onan his brother, Go unto thy brother's wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her, and raise up a seed unto thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed would not be his, but his brother's only. And he went into the house of his brother's wife, and split the seed on the ground. And he was wicked in the eyes of the Lord, and he slew him. This is very tragic. Very simply written, but a very tragic story. And Judah said unto Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain in thy father's house as a widow till Shelah, my son, be grown up, and I shall give him thee to wife. And he grew up, but Bedsuel, the wife of Judah, did not permit her son Shelah to marry. And Bedsuel, the wife of Judah, died in the fifth year of this week. And in the sixth year, Judah went up to, the se to seer his sheep at Timnah, and they told Tamar, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up, to Tamar to shear his sheep. And she put off her widow's clothes and put on a veil and adorned herself and sat at the gate adjoining the way to Tanah. And as Judah was going along, he found her, and he thought her to be an harlot. And he said unto her, Let me come into thee. And she said, Come in. And he went in. That's interesting. So men in this time were allowed to like have their fun with like women, but women were not allowed to do the same. Very, very interesting. And she said unto him, Give me my hire. And he said unto her, I have nothing in my hand save my ring that is on my finger and my necklace and my staff which is on my hand. And she said unto him, Give them to me until thou dost send me my hire. And he said unto her, I will send unto thee a kid of goats. And he gave them to her. And he went in unto her and she conceived by him. And Judah went unto his sleep and she went to her father's house. And Judah sent a kid of goats by the hand of his shepherd, and he found her not. And he asked the people of the place, saying, Where is the harlot who is here? And they said, There is no harlot here with us. Now, just a side note, if you guys are keeping up with Melissa Red Pill the Nation, she um, did a really great breakdown of Revelation and also the bloodline of, of Mr. T. I think you guys know who I'm talking about. And apparently he is descendant of Judah and Tamar, if I'm remembering correctly. So this is kind of his line story. So that's interesting. Anyway, verse 16. 
And when she had completed three months, it was manifested that she was with child. And they told Judah, saying, Behold, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, is with child by whoredom. And Judah went to the house of her father and said unto her father, to her brothers, Bring her forth and let them burn her, for she hath wrought uncleanliness in Israel. And it came to pass, when they brought her forth to burn her, that she sent to her father-in-law the ring and the necklace and the staff, saying, Discern who... Whose are these? For by him I am with child. And Judah acknowledged and said, Tamar is more righteous than I am, and therefore let them burn her not. That's so, this is just kind of making me a little mad because he literally went and had an affair with a harlot, basically, from their verbiage in this book. And he's okay, he can do that, but the fact that his he thought his daughter-in-law had gotten pregnant from just like sleeping around. She now is to be, you know, burned for it. Like that, that's disgusting. Glad we live in modern times now where we, we wouldn't do that. So, all right. Verse 20. For the reason she was not given to Shalad, he did not again approach her. And after that, she bare two sons, Perez and Zerah, in the seventh year of this second week. And thereupon the seven years of fruitfulness were accomplished, of which Joseph spake to Pharaoh. So now we're going back into Joseph of the seven years of, of abundance in Egypt before, before the famine. So we're kind of trying to see what's going on during the timeline in both of these areas. And Judah acknowledged that the deed which he had done was evil, for he had lain with his daughter-in-law, and he esteemed it hateful in his eyes. And he acknowledged that he had transgressed and gone astray, for he had uncovered the skirt of his son, and he began to laminate and to supplicate before the Lord because of his transgressions. And we told him in a dream that it was forgiven him, because he supplicated earnestly and laminated and did not, and did not again commit it. And he received forgiveness because he turned from his sin and from his ignorance. And he transgressed greatly before our God. And every one that acteth thus, every one who lieth with his mother-in-law, let them burn him with fire that he may burn therein. For there is uncleanliness and pollution upon them. With the fire, let them burn them. So once again, that is obviously now bringing us back to the present time of the story where God and the angels are speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai, which again is the present time of this particular book. I hope that makes sense. If you've been following along, that probably makes sense. So, and do thou command the children of Israel that there be no uncleanliness amongst them for everyone who lieth with his daughter-in-law or with his mother-in-law hath wrought uncleanliness. With fire, let them burn the man who hath lain with her, and likewise the woman, and he will turn away wrath and punishment from Israel. So at least now they're saying men and women are equally to be punished, not just the women. That's that's ooh, that's good, I guess. And unto Judah we said that his two sons who had not lain with her, and for this reason his seed was established for a second generation, and would not be rooted out. For in singleness of eye he had gone and sought for punishment, namely according to the judgment of Abraham, which he had commanded his sons, Judah had sought to burn her with fire. This brings us to chapter 41, the journeying of the sons of Jacob to Egypt. And in the first year of the third week of the 45th Jubilee, the famine began to come into the land and the rain refused to be given to the earth for none whatever fell. And the earth grew barren, but in the land of Egypt there was food, for Joseph had gathered the seed of the land in the seven years of plenty and had preserved it. And the Egyptians came to Joseph that he might give them food, and he opened the storehouse where there was grain of the first year, and he sold it to the people of the land for gold. So he's setting himself up a little grocery store in Egypt. Now the famine was very sore in the land of Canaan, and Jacob heard that there was food in Egypt. And he sent his ten sons that they should pro procure food for him in Egypt. But Benjamin he did not send. And the ten sons of Jacob arrived in Egypt among those that went there. So again, Joseph was one of Jacob's twelve sons. And then Benjamin obviously is the youngest. He's too young to go. So now the, the other ten are going into Egypt to try to find food because there is a famine. 
And Joseph recognized them, but he, but they did not recognize him. And he spake unto them and questioned them and said unto them, Are ye not spies, and have ye not come to explore and approach the land? And he put them in ward. And after that he set them free again and detained Simeon alone and sent off his nine brothers. And he filled their sacks with corn. He put their gold in their sacks and heat and they did not know. And he commanded them to bring their younger brother for they had told him their father was living with their younger brother. And they went up to the land of Egypt and they came back to the land of Canaan and they told their father all that had befallen them and how the Lord of the country had spoken roughly to them and had seized Simeon till they should bring Benjamin. And Jacob said, me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon also is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. Oh, me hath your wickedness come. So he thinks that now, he, he, he believes that he's lost Joseph. Little do they know that Joseph now has kind of kept Simeon, his brother, behind so that he could see his youngest brother. But his father, Jacob, thinks that now he's lost three sons. And he said, my son will not go down with you, least purchased he fall sick. For their mother gave birth to two sons, and one hath perished, and this one also ye will take from me. If perchance he took a fever on the road, ye would bring down my old age with sorrow unto death. For he saw that their money had been returned to every man in his sack, and for this reason he feared to send him. Because remember, Joseph gave them the food, but also had his brothers keep their money. And the famine increased and became sore in the land of, of Canaan. And in all the lands, save in the land of Egypt, for many of the children of the Egyptians had stored up their seed for food from the time when they saw Joseph gathering seed together and putting it in the storehouse and preserving it for the years of famine. And the people of Egypt fed themselves thereon during the first year of their famine. But when Israel saw that the famine was very sore in the land and there was no deliverance, he said unto his sons, Go again and pr procure food for us, that we die not. And they said, We shall not go unless our youngest brother go with us. We shall not go. And Israel saw that if he did not send him with them, they should all perish by reason of famine. And Reuben said, Give him into my hands, and if I do not bring him back to thee, slay my two sons instead of his soul. And he said unto him, He will not go with thee. And Judah came near and said, Send him with me, and if I do not bring him back to thee, let me bear the blame before thee all the days of my life. And he sent him with them the second year of this week on the first day of this month, and they came to the land of Egypt with all those who went, and they had pres presents in their hands, almonds and terabith's nuts and pure honey. And they went and stood before Joseph. And he saw Benjamin, his brother, and he knew him. And he said unto them, Is this your youngest brother? And they said unto him, It is he. And he said, The Lord be great, gracious to thee, my son. And he sent him into his house, and he brought forth Simeon unto them. And he made a feast for them, and they presented to him the gifts which they had brought from their hands. And they ate before him and gave them all a portion. But the portion of Benjamin was seven times larger than that of any of theirs. And they ate and drank and arose and remained in their asses. And Joseph devised a plan where he might learn their thoughts as to whether thoughts of peace prevailed amongst them. And he said to the stewards who was over his house, Fill all their sacks with food and return their money unto them until their vessels and my cup and the silver cup out which I drank, put it in the sack of the youngest, and send them away. And that concludes our reading from today. I actually didn't realize we had gotten all the way to chapter 43, where we're going to pause it right there. I love the story of Joseph in Egypt, so I'm excited to be here. I know we don't have that much left of the Book of Jubilees, but again, once we finish this book, we will be starting the Apocalypse of Abraham Apparently there's like, there were supposed to be 777 books in the Bible, so that means we are missing from the Bible 711 books. I know that there is only a select few books available to us right now, as the Vatican has hidden most of them from us. But we will continue on this journey for as long as we can reviewing all of these books. Once again, please make sure if you can to join us on the Dark Outpost at one o'clock on Tuesdays live on that platform 
Once again, there is a link to the platform down in the description box below. All right, guys, I hope that you all are having a wonderful, wonderful week, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.